Professor Jayshree. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to kind of thank the teachers, the students, the researchers, and of course, all the curious gens are there. All these classifications are inclusive. We had a good number of people who were not teachers uh, also, who, who kind of were interested in this uh, workshop. So I thank you all to join us. We expend, ex extend a warm welcome to all of you, especially those who attended the last workshop. We got delayed by two months and we were hoping to hold a live session like last time, but then didn't see the point of waiting for longer. So we went ahead and had this, arranged this virtual conference. And, uh, but the nice thing is we were able to reach a wider audience. So that's a plus point. So this year, the speakers will be covering uh, the learning process with a wider perspective. There is a uh, special focus on science and math, uh, both in learning and in teaching. And uh, so we kind of extended what we did in the last workshop to kind of cover maybe a little more specifics. We a special thanks to all speakers who agreed immediately because they all have their own loads, but they were very uh, accommodating. And um, all these, the pandemic disruptions and all it seemed to have not bothered them so much. So that's a nice thing. And of course, all of them showed a keen interest to interact with teachers. And that's a big plus point. An equal, if not greater, applause to the teachers, students, and parents who adapted quickly to the to bring in some semblance of normalcy in education, beating all odds. It is indeed the greatest feat and one we should be all proud of. Um, so I am again extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Given that we have only two hours a day, so let me not take any more time. Um, so we have a limit of 300. But uh, so please, all of you who have registered, attend all sessions. And uh, as we had to request many to watch the live stream, I'm hoping many people will join in the next few minutes. Do keep your mic and video off when your lecture is on, unless the speaker wants an answer from you, then please unmute only, don't use your video. And convey your questions via chat. We have volunteers, student volunteers, uh, who will be collating the questions and they can ask the speaker at the end. Each talk is for 45 minutes. It's followed by 15 minutes of questions and we will keep the timing. We really hope you'll enjoy all the sessions. And before we would sign off, I would like to recognize the volunteers, Madhukar, Aditya, Yushi, Vivek, Kunal, for all the work they've put in to the PR team. And this is admin and the Coxi lab members. And once again, thank you. And I now request our director, Professor P.J. Narayanan, to say a few words, to welcome the, the gathering, and also, of course, uh, to start off this series of uh, talks. Over to you, Pijan. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, welcome. Good evening, good morning, good noon, whatever. In the online world, people are joining from all time zones. Uh, it's an opportunity to catch more people, and I'm told the number of registrations uh, are quite high. Uh, and so that's a good sign. This is a very important topic, uh, a topic that I personally don't understand much or anything at all. But I know that, that the neuroscience or the brain is probably the last frontier, how, we, how the brain works, how we think, how we understand uh, all aspects of the brain. Uh, most aspects of the brain is understood very less and uh, especially its uh, interaction with you know the brain its neuro neural part of the brain and its interaction with the learning process for very young children uh, is a very important topic uh, and, and i'm very glad that this is being hosted by our is conducted by our uh, uh, coxi team we had a interesting uh, session last year and uh, this year in covid year we are Again, doing it a little delayed, as Kavita said, but I'm very uh, glad to see very eminent uh, uh, speakers being lined up for, for this event, starting with uh, Professor Jayashri Ramdas or uh, Anil Gupta or Raj Reddy, Professor Narayanan and, and many others. So I'm looking forward to these talks and, and the discussions myself, and I, I'm sure all the listeners are also eager to listen to these talks. Triple uh, IIT Hyderabad is an IT-based institution. We are, we, but we, we interpret IT or information technology very broadly. 
wherever computing whether it's hardware kind or software kind or processing kind is has a strong component of any other domain we are we want to do those things so neuroscience or cognitive science is obviously a very uh, important area to understand how we do things and how to make computers do things but even otherwise we have been applying computing to many other domain areas mostly in the masters phd level uh, this this these domains or computing plus something else uh, domains that currently being researched on or have programs in in the institute include computational natural sciences bioinformatics etc computational computational structural engineering intelligent buildings uh, computational linguistics uh, and even uh, you know computational human sciences which is the confluence of humanity social sciences and the computing so we have Uh, transdisciplinary programs in many of these areas where the btech or undergraduate degrees in in uh, computing or computer science and the masters degrees in one of these areas such as computational natural science or computational humanities etc so we want to uh, to realize that you know to recognize the fact that computing is very basic it applies to many areas and enriches many areas and those areas will in turn enrich computing and our algorithms or core concept so that is why we have so many uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary programs and cogsci is stuck right in the middle of all these and uh, i'm glad that this thing is happening again i welcome all of you once more to this uh, the learning brain workshop uh, i hand it back to kavita to take the proceeding for thank you uh Thank you, Professor P. J. N. Uh, thank you, and uh, we'll start off the talks uh, because uh, we we want to have a lot of questions that can be answered. So, uh, Professor Jayshree, if you're all set, uh, you can share your screen. Before that, uh, Vivek will give us uh, introduction of the uh, speaker. Uh, Vivek, over to you. Um. Yes, ma'am. Uh, So our first speaker for the day, Professor Jayashree Ramadas, is a leading educationist who is the center director of the Homi Baba Center for Science Education of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Her PhD thesis on science education in India was amongst the first works in the domain. She is currently a professor at the TIFR Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Hyderabad, and in her own words, seeks ways to improve teaching and learning of science in schools and in formal settings. Over to you, ma'am. hi thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, just a, a correction there uh, uh, probably this uh, intro is taken from my the this wikipedia article and i just checked it out and it's uh, outdated unfortunately so it is uh, so i'm not at, uh, i'm not a triple uh, sorry uh, tfr hyderabad anymore i am retired i retired uh, a year and a half ago and i'm based in chennai now so uh, but uh, you know it's it's really a pleasure to join this group and particularly when i got to know that the cogsci group is arranging a workshop for teachers i'm i'm really thrilled about it because uh, I, i mean this is what this is what we need really this is the kind of inputs that we need in education so uh, to start with uh, you know I, i have a confession i mean i have a few confessions and i have a request to you all so first is that this is my first online talk and uh, i'm rather nervous addressing a large audience across the country and uh, you know whom i cannot even see because it's these little black rectangles uh, so i have no idea if you're following me um if whether you're listening if you're bored or even if you're there so um I, and I, you know thinking of that i really admire uh, all of you who have been doing this online teaching day after day for the entire year for the past uh, one year in covid times and um uh, you know it's i i really salute you it's a, 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 a it's a very hard situation that we're in in education and i hope we can get through it and i hope we will meet face to face uh, sometime soon so in the meanwhile so that is my confession the request is that uh, please use the chat box so uh, whatever questions comments ideas that you have 
uh, please freely use the chat box and uh, uh, I may not be able to get to all the questions here in this talk, but uh, uh, please leave your contact. If you leave your contact email, then I will definitely get in touch with you and uh, we can have a conversation because uh, uh, this is something uh, I'm really keen to have a conversation with teachers about. Okay, so to start uh, uh, with the talk, the topic is Curiosity Learning and Savaliram 2.0. Now, curiosity is something you all know. It's something very familiar. When you see it, you know what is curiosity. You know where curiosity is uh, in action. So uh, we'll start with the familiar thing. The second part is learning, uh, which is a little more problematic. In fact, it's pretty problematic as we know as teachers, you know, often we try to make learning happen. We try to get the children to learn, uh, but uh, succeed sometimes, it doesn't succeed sometimes. And uh, what's worse, we don't even know sometimes if we have succeeded or not, unless we have the proper assessment tools and uh, which, which is another uh, problematic area. So uh, learning is uh, really problematic and I'm really glad that this entire workshop is actually uh, you know, uh, uh, devoted to learning. And um, uh, it's, uh, uh, learning is something I think as teachers, we keep learning about and it's never complete. This uh, learning is never complete, but we try to improve and try to become as effective as possible. The uh, uh, last part is Savaliram uh, 2.0, which you may be hearing this for the first time. And I will be talking about this platform. It's a collaborative platform for teachers uh, to understand children's curiosity and questioning. And I, uh, I'll tell you, uh, be talking more about this. Uh, now, just as this, uh, I think there is a poll going on uh, I hope that you have all got this poll and there are five questions in it. And I hope uh, the teachers amongst you are responding to these questions. And at some point during the talk, uh, this, uh, uh, can, can you confirm uh, uh, Vivek, uh, if the poll is on? If yes, ma'am. has been sent to the teachers. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, Okay, you know, I find I cannot change the slides. I'll probably have to open the presentation in my own uh, screen and then I can change the slide. Oops. Ah, okay, I have to do this. Okay. So this is the online poll. We'll come to this. There are five questions. We'll, co we'll come to it later in the talk. So uh, what is curiosity? Uh, like I said, curiosity uh, is something which you know, you recognize when somebody is being curious. So now I will uh, just ask you to imagine, uh, 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 imagine all of these things which you see on the screen. So imagine a baby in a cradle what does she do? How does she react to your face, to sounds, or to, uh, uh, to a toy hanging above her? And, uh, uh, you know, you will see where curiosity comes in action. We'll, uh, uh, so just, just imagine all these situations. Think of an infant as it grows up, starts crawling, starts walking, talking. I'm sure that these are all experiences which are uh, familiar to you and just think back and see where you have seen this curiosity in action. Then you go on to children in your own classroom. Maybe they're sitting in front of you or uh, perhaps they're in the playground or they may be at home. Where do you see curiosity in action? Then let's come to grown people, so a grown person, say you. How do you express your curiosity? And what makes you curious? Just reflect on this. Think of people in different professions. 
an artist, a doctor, a farmer, a scientist, and think of where, where do they express their curiosity? Think of your parents or your grandparents. Do they express curiosity and where? So let's begin with babies. And what uh, researchers have found. So in these slides, uh, you know, I will not go through every point in detail. So if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box if you want details about any particular thing. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a reference. And uh, in fact, you uh, with just the name of the author, all these references are available on Savaliram, which I will talk about later. Or if you don't want to get into that, you can always ask your questions on the, uh, on the screen. So uh, let's uh, begin with babies. They are, uh, uh, you know, newborn before two months. Uh, are, they pay more attention to familiar faces and familiar sounds, or rather they prefer familiar uh, faces. Not, their eyesight uh, is not yet so developed to focus very well on things, but they show a preference for familiar things. And uh, I, I, there's an interesting experiment. Uh, the, the researchers recorded the crying of a baby and then played the crying back to the baby. Then they recorded uh, uh, crying of other babies and played it, uh, uh, played it back to uh, the first baby. And I, it turns out that with their own, with the sound of their own crying, they kind of listen carefully. With the sound of other babies crying, they get more distressed. And you know, you might have noticed it when a lot of babies get together, one starts crying, the others also start crying. So it is a cry of the other babies that distresses them. But in fact, their own cry, if you play back to them, uh, apparently it soothes them. I have not tried it, but it's something which you could certainly try. Now, uh, more than two months, uh, the preference goes from familiar things to novel things. So a new face or a new toy or a new sound, a novel sound is something uh, which they pay more attention to. Uh, they grow up a little more uh, at about nine months. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, you're carrying a baby and they point somewhere. And then you say Baba, or you say fool, whatever it is, you know, you name that, or you say something about it. And you might uh, wonder, I mean, are, are, are the kids really training us uh, to teach them. And in fact, it seems to be something like that because uh, the pointing is a way for the child to get the adult's attention and to get them to teach them something about the world. Now, even at this early uh, stage, the openness to exploration uh, of a baby is shaped in many ways by the caregivers, by the people uh, by the mother or uh, parents or uh, whoever is taking care of the child, their actions and reactions are uh, most crucial in how much uh, the baby will explore, how much the baby will show uh, curiousness. And that's, that's really remarkable. Now our child has grown up and uh, they have learned to speak. And language is the most powerful tool of learning. I cannot emphasize this enough. It is, it is the single most thing that helps you to learn. And in this age of two to five years old, children ask the maximum number of questions. See, you see, uh, children at this age, they're at home. They cannot read. So how do they know? How do they know what happened, say, last year? They don't remember what happened uh, you know, when they were a year old. Or uh, uh, they see their mom and dad going out. Where are, they, where are they going? What do they do? What are the things out there? What all is there in the world? 
So the only way that the child can find out is through asking questions and they make full use of this. And whom do they ask? They ask a knowledgeable, sympathetic and trustworthy person. Now, I was also very surprised to find this out that children can actually uh, understand who would be the person who would give them the most reliable uh, information. Uh, and these are all experiments which have been done. And uh, uh, so, you know, at this very young age, uh, children know a lot and they know a lot about how to find out about the world. Now, the same children uh, may be going to preschool. And uh, these researchers have also um, uh, seen how many questions they ask in preschool. And they found that there is a sharp drop in the number of questions that the students, uh, the, the children ask in school. The same kids go home, they're, you know, chattering away and they're asking questions, but in school, they're very quiet. So at this point, let's stop and see what is curiosity. And uh, uh, I'd like you to just uh, read this slide. And I'll focus on only a few words uh, uh, in this slide. So you see, you see words like urge and desire. So curiosity is, a, is like a drive. It's a very basic drive. It is like hunger. See, if you're hungry, you look for food. And if you're curious, what do you look for? You seek information, you seek learning. And this is not, uh, I, I, you know, so I'm saying this because there is very solid scientific evidence uh, for this happening. In, in fact, evidence from neuroscience. And you might have heard uh, uh, curiosity is the hunger of the mind. It's, it's something that, uh, that is just said. But uh, neuroscientists have found that the very same reward systems which are active in satisfaction of hunger, these same neural circuits are also active in the satisfaction of curiosity. So there is a definite parallel and there is a definite, in fact, uh, correspondence between hunger for food and hunger for knowledge. Okay, the second uh, thing that I'd like you to focus on is emotionally induced. That's the third uh, line there an emotionally induced exploratory desire to solve a knowledge gap. So what emotionally induced, again, it is in the brain, it is the limbic system, the so-called emotional, and I'm, I think you will be learning uh, more about the brain and about uh, in this very workshop. So I hope this will come up sometime. But it is the emotional brain uh, which is at work in the expression of curiosity. And gaining knowledge is, of course, an intellectual process. And this is a very uh, remarkable way in which emotion and intellect come together. Intellect is uh, in the prefrontal cortex. These come together in the expression of curiosity. OK. The third thing I want you to look at here uh, is uh, in the second point a desire to seek and learn new information by exploring novel, complex, and uncertain environments. Now, these three words are extremely important. Novel, something new, complex, so not simple, and uncertain. So you're not sure about something, you want to know, you want to resolve some uncertainty. And, uh, uh, the reason we need to focus on this is that uh, it gives us clues to how we can arouse curiosity. So novelty, complexity, and uncertainty. And you think of whether these characteristics are there in your school, in your classes, in your teaching. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, you realize that actually 
school is, uh, you know, is very predictable. We always try to simplify things. We always try to make sure that things go according to schedule, according to plan, which is fine. I mean, things work very well. Uh, but inadvertently, we are throwing out curiosity from this whole process. The last point is that curiosity is an individual quality. It's expressed in a physical, social, and cultural context. And uh, this is also extremely important that we think of an individual as being curious, but the expression of curiosity is very much driven by the context and uh, by the social norms, by cultural norms, by how people around uh, uh, behave. And these, these, uh, so these definitions are really key to how curiosity works and how, uh, 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 how, how it acts out in, uh, in the world. Okay, are the poll results in? If so, uh, would it be possible to see them at this point? Yeah, I'm sure I'll share my screen. Yeah, yeah. So at this point, I've really, uh, you know, made the main points that I wanted to make in this talk about curiosity. And uh, um, after this, we will come uh, really to the applications and uh, how, uh, Work out. Okay, great. Teaching experience. Yeah, most of you have six years of teaching experience. Uh, there are only eight responses. Have the teachers asked you questions? So one, I guess, is uh, rarely or something. I, I'm not sure. Uh, the question is. Uh, yes, ma'am. Wow. Okay, so one is often. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the graphs. Okay, great. So six of you say that uh, students often ask you questions. Uh, four of you say that. Uh, you have heard children asking questions outside. Uh, one person says that they have, uh, um, that rarely heard children asking questions. So I, uh, you know, I would like to urge all of you who, to whom children do ask questions that uh, later I will, I will explain the Savaliram database, but I would really uh, appreciate it if you could contribute questions to the Savaliram database. It's a national database of children's questions. Okay, the next uh, next uh, graph. Is it desirable that students are fantastic? Everybody says that it's desirable that students ask questions, and everyone says that it's useful in classroom teaching and learning. That's great. That's great. Hmm. Okay, so now we have six responses here. Wow, this is great. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you see how widely children think and how, uh, and, and also you see how hard it is to answer their questions. So it is, we must not, uh, uh, you know, underestimate this part that uh, children, uh, you know, sometimes you may know the answer, you, uh, I mean, you have some outline of an answer. But it is really very hard. If you ask me to answer any of these questions, I cannot answer any of them uh, offhand. So, uh, I, I, so I think this should, uh, you should feel reassured and kind of, uh, it's okay. It's okay that you don't know the answers to questions, but it is very interesting and uh, children's questions do tell you something about how they think. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Please write your remarks, whatever, uh, in, the, um, in the chat box. Okay, so let's get back to the school kids. And uh, let's see these uh, children in elementary school. And now, uh, 
uh, you know, unlike the preschool children, the everyday things are familiar. Everyday world is quite familiar to them. And their questions are less obvious. They respond to, you know, more subtle clues. They go into details more than, uh, than the younger kids. Jayashree, you have to share your screen again. Oh, I'm sorry. the screen and uh, I'm actually not able to see the uh, let me try again Vivek is your screen being shared if not you have to unshare it sometimes um, ah, yeah, I get it. I get okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm getting it. Can you see the screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so like I said, the questions are less obvious, but they are there. And, uh, uh, you know, the last point uh, I, I, I'd like to say first that the adult feedback is, is becomes more critical at this age. And uh, uh, so all of this is, you know, based on real research studies, uh, you know, a lot of data. And um, so I'm not giving the data now, I'm just making these statements. Uh, but, uh, you know, definitely if you're interested, please go to these references and check out the data uh, there. I think the key thing here is to realize that uh, uh, children's learning is very much dependent on their curiosity uh, behavior and that questions have a potential in the classroom. And uh, 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 so th this is based on a big uh, survey that was done of, um, uh, you know, they measured curiosity using some measures and uh, looked at what are the specific achieve, uh, you know, predictors at a young age, how can you predict the achievement of students at an older age. And what they found is that more even than, uh, you would think that verbal ability or uh, mathematical ability, quantitative ability is, 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 would be the best predictor of achievement. Uh, but uh, rather, uh, these researchers found that curiosity and conscientiousness are the two, how sincere the kids are uh, in, at, at the, with, the, with the tasks. And uh, these are the uh, two main predictors they found which drive performance. So there's something for us teachers to understand from this, you know, it, I, I think it's, there's an important takeaway here. Okay, so I, I, now we come to the teenage years, adolescence, and uh, the children are now uh, much more independent. They go around on their own. They meet new people, see places. So, you know, they, they're not reduced to, you know, just asking about everything. Uh, they also have a strong desire for new information and knowledge. Now it becomes more explicit. And at the same time, the possibilities are also wider. They're, they have much, much more things. I mean, they can, they can go anywhere, they can look at the internet. You know, there are many possibilities for getting new knowledge. Also, uh, this exploration that uh, they do at this age in the adolescent years, it helps in identity formation in adulthood. And because it's, there's a very key stage where children are growing up, they're, they're finding out who they are. And uh, this exploration is very critical to that identity formation. But there are uh, risks which I have put in red. And uh, so incidentally, the second point says motivation decreases from elementary to middle to high school. And I've said USA in brackets because uh, uh, the research that I've seen is from the US, but I'm told that there is also research uh, from India or at least teachers in India have told me that this happens, that uh, a, a kid's motivation goes down as they come to high school in the adolescent years. 
and they might get frustrated, anxious, and uh, you know, instead of the motivation that they had in uh, middle school. Now, at this stage, again, the adults and uh, peers are role models for the children. So getting good role models at this age and role models who will model curiosity for them, who will, uh, you know, who will themselves be seeking information, who will themselves be learning. And of course, now these role models need not be right next door. They could be, uh, you know, far away, but children need to know about other people who are also, you know, trying to gain knowledge. And maybe particular kinds of knowledge. Okay, so uh, now, uh, you know, let's just summarize and uh, or rather, um, here I have put some points which uh, come out from neuroscience research and uh, a neuroscience and education research. And basically the highlights are that curiosity is important for uh, motivation, for memory. So we remember better the information which we have been curious about. If you're curious about something you find out and you find that out, we remember it much better. Uh, that may be not so surprising. What is more surprising is that if you are curious about something, you may learn other things during that uh, uh, high state of uh, uh, curiosity. Uh, you learn those other things also better. So it, you have better memory for the things which you have learned during states of high curiosity. Also, uh, like I mentioned before, that uh, improved academic performance uh, uh, results from curiosity. So it's a kind of summary of curiosity and learning. And I will not go much further uh, than this. I hope that the rest of the conference and like I said, learning is something which we're always learning about. Okay, now let us pause a bit and think that, you know, okay, fine, this all looks good. Uh, but perhaps there are some barriers to curiosity. Just take a few seconds to just think, what are the barriers? Think back again at your classes, what happens in school, what happens in your, when you're teaching? What do you think comes between children's expression of curiosity and what actually happens? So Jayashree, we have one uh, reply which says self-doubt. Self-doubt, absolutely. Fear, fear yeah. of judgment. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So again, this is something that uh, researchers have gone out and interviewed lots of teachers. And um, I haven't given the references here, but I can, I can tell you uh, uh, later what they are. But uh, uh, people have found, uh, uh, I mean, so uh, uh, teachers appreciate the importance of questioning. They are sure that it is a good thing, that it helps children learn. It is something that teachers know intuitively. But they find uh, there are other, other uh, priorities that you have as a teacher. You have a plan of work. Uh, you have a, a syllabus to cover. And... Uh, uh, the main thing is like self-doubt, uh, 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 somebody mentioned. What if you don't have an answer to that question? And often, uh, you know, although you may have some sort of an outline for the answer, you don't exactly know the facts. You can't recall them right at that moment. You don't want to make a mistake. Uh, you have your, uh, you know, the students look up to you as a teacher and what if you make a terrible mistake? So this self-doubt is really, a very critical aspect of uh, uh, why questioning in the classroom is uh, often discouraged by teachers, even while knowing how important it is. 
Uh, there's just one more comment, uh, Jayashree. Yeah, yeah. This is basically uh, when the teacher is not able to explain properly, so the mm -hmm. children lose interest. Mm -hmm. This one and syllabus is what you covered. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that's an important point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So let's come back to some positive aspects. We looked at a lot about uh, how curiosity is uh, uh, critical for the children's learning, uh, but for the teachers also it's uh, useful. How uh, you get to know what are students interested in? What is it that they want to learn? Uh, you know, you normally have your uh, uh, lessons well prepared and, uh, uh, but how does one get the children's input into it? Even in a given topic, what is it that the children want to know about that given topic? Uh, then, uh, you know, when children ask questions, you get to know what are their doubts, what are their misunderstandings also can come through uh, from the questions. I, I'm just remembering one question that uh, a child asked. Uh, uh, she said, uh, yeah, the planets all go around the sun uh, but what is there below the planets? And I was totally floored by this question. I had no idea that uh, the kids were thinking about planetary, even though they could say, uh, you know, they could name the planets, they could say they go in elliptical orbits, but they had a basic misunderstanding about uh, the solar system. So if you know that children have these ideas and misunderstandings, you could address these perhaps while teaching a topic. So what do we need here? We need to create spaces for questions. Uh, we need to create spaces in every classroom. So, um, you know, just before this talk, again, I was discussing with my uh, teacher friend about what you could do to create these spaces in the classroom. And uh, uh, some of these one also sees from experiences of other teachers that ideally you would like to integrate questioning with your teaching, but supposing it doesn't work or initially it, it, that may be hard uh, for you to integrate it actually in your lessons. But uh, you could perhaps keep a question box. Uh, you could have a bulletin board where, and this has been done. This has been done in uh, uh, a few schools. Uh, they have put up a bulletin board saying my questions and children, and it's anonymous. So children, uh, nobody knows who has asked that question and children like that because they don't want to be laughed at just like teachers don't like to be laughed at. So also children. So they uh, write their questions there. There's a, um, you could keep an extra period, maybe have do questioning as a game or uh, you may post interesting articles and uh, teachers, uh, uh, sorry, ask the students, keep, keep a blank paper nearby and let the ch children ask uh, questions about the article on that, you know, what, what questions come to your mind. So just write them down. And uh, uh, most importantly, you have to make the kids feel that questions are welcome. That this is something which you, you want them to do and then they will feel free to ask the questions. The next thing is that, see, you're not a lone teacher. You are in a community, in your school, maybe across uh, schools also. So in the community of teachers, questioning uh, could be a thing that is talked about. You know, for example, in the staff room or in teachers meetings, you could mention, oh, uh, you know, my student came up with this fantastic question. I have no idea what is the answer. Do you know what is the answer? So if this becomes a thing that is discussed uh, uh, amongst teachers, it might perhaps become acceptable. Finally, we could create perhaps collaborative communities across levels of schooling, across schools and colleges and universities, uh, perhaps uh, you know, university students and uh, uh, faculty might be more able to address uh, the questions that uh, the kids are asking. 
which are you know uh, uh, children's questions the thing about them is that they're very easy to state but they're difficult to answer and uh, therefore perhaps you need a higher level of uh, education to answer those questions now if these communities could collaborate across the levels i think we would if we could get that dialogue going uh, uh, that that would really be something and uh, which brings me to sawali ram because this is exactly what we are trying to do in sawali ram to create these collaborative communities across uh, the levels So Savali Ram, this is uh, um, the final part of my talk. And uh, uh, let me begin with what is the genesis of Savali Ram. Savali Ram was a character uh, which was created in the Hoshangabad Science Teaching Program. This is a very well-known program in uh, uh, education which ran for thirty years. and perhaps some of you have heard of it so this character was created in this program in the 1970s uh and uh, children would uh, so this was a rural uh, uh, program and uh, uh, children used to write post they used to write their questions on postcards see it was an inquiry based program so children had a lot of questions and obviously they could not you know it was impossible for a teacher to satisfy uh, their curiosity so they would write their questions on postcards and send them to uh, uh, to this character called savali ram and savali ram was actually a group of scientists and university teachers who would sit down and uh, you know break their heads over the question and uh, you know I, I, if you want to know more about it you can find out also from the savali ram site the process of answering these questions and uh, so that that is what happened and it is still happening uh, it is uh, the uh, savali ram through post and uh, the questions are now not uh, children don't get direct uh, responses but they are published in magazines now savali ram 2.0 is a digital version of uh, the old savali ram and uh, eklavya the organization which uh, was uh, key in the hoshangabad science teaching program is uh, the one who has initiated savali ram so what is savali ram it is a firstly it is an online repository of questions and answers and articles students questions their answers articles and resources uh, i'll 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 show you some of the pages from the website and some of you might you know already be going to its savaliram.org so uh, you can explore the website secondly it's a platform to collaborate on answering questions on writing articles so it is a place where teachers can share uh, their experiences of curiosity and um, uh, they can read about what other teachers have shared and uh, there is uh, you can also translate the content into very, across uh, various languages and uh, finally it allows access to data and uh, access you know anybody want might want to look at the data it could be researchers or it could be teachers or just the general public and it lets uh, people view the results of the data analysis and also do their own analysis uh, with the data here is the home page of savali ram and the site consists of two parts uh, there is a public facing site and as of now uh, there are uh, more than 3600 questions uh, in seven languages in uh, tamil telugu malayalam uh, hindi marathi um, english you can view the analytics you can read uh, answers to about a quarter of the questions you can read 10 articles uh, locate resources and research papers and i'll show you these pages where it's that so the first part is this public facing part which everybody can see the second part uh, uh, you have to log in so you have to log in and teachers or volunteers can submit questions which uh, children have asked 
experts can answer them and they can review the answers of uh, of other experts because all of these you know none of the uh, answers are published you know unlike cora or some other uh, sites uh, the answers are reviewed all answers are reviewed by other experts and then uh, uh, maybe mo often modified and then published and translators can translate answers in articles so this is all after from the dashboard this is what uh, the search page of savadi ram looks like and i really encourage you to explore the search page uh, you can um, uh, you know put in any keyword and look at uh, questions which have that word uh, or something like it you can uh, filter by subject so uh, you can see all the questions in biology all the questions in mathematics uh, asked uh you can search by state uh, or you can search by language uh, so uh, you know just just uh, you can explore this page and you can see what what is there and i hope one day uh, your children's questions will also be on this website i i really hope that you all will contribute questions from your own children so that they find a reflection on this national database here are some example questions and uh, you know you can see how varied they are in different languages you, uh, there is telugu malayalam tamil marathi hindi bangla so these i, I just selected a few of the questions so you get an idea of what the questions look like if you are interested if you're a data freak uh, you know you may want to look at the analytics page um in which you can uh, uh, you know look at the data in various ways there are also other ways so those who are interested in the data part you know you can get in touch and there are other ways also to view the data on external websites so this is just some of the graphs and you know some interesting patterns come out like uh you know from this it just jumps out at you that uh, biology is the most popular subject you see the red bar for both boys and girls biology by far is the most popular subject and uh, you know it just breaks the common stereotype that uh, girls are more interested in biology and boys are more interested in uh, engineering or physics or whatever you know everybody is interested in biology followed by physics yeah this is the most important page in my view it is the most important page for teachers uh because this is where teachers uh, share their experiences and you can read about how um other teachers have dealt uh, with this uh issue of curiosity how they have tried to nurture curiosity and how they ha may have succeeded some of the failures whatever it is but it is i think uh, nice for teachers to share experiences and this page allows you to do that it might give you some ideas which you can use in your own classroom then there is the resources page which has uh, books magazines websites on curiosity so you can explore that uh, jay shree yeah uh, can we take some questions uh, right right i am almost yeah. at the end so yeah. i'll just go through the slides so okay. there is a research page i mentioned that all the references that i used are uh, uh, you can find them in the research page this is what the dashboard looks like when you if you log in you get these options and finally uh, the website is built through contribution of uh, teachers developers researchers and subject experts and uh, the development is in the open source for those of you who are familiar with github so this is my last slide would you like to volunteer would you like to contribute your students questions would you like to share your experiences of questioning and learning you can go to these pages and see how other teachers have done it and please get in touch or please uh, uh, put your email id in the chat box and we'll get in touch with you thank you thank you i'll stop here thank you um if anybody has any questions they can either put it up in the chat or if you want to 
kind of ask the question, please do so, but briefly. Uh, just phrase your question clearly. So shall I stop screen sharing? Yeah. 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 Any questions? Yeah. Um, there's one question uh, from Mr. Irfan. He says, mm -hmm. what would be negative aspect of being curious and unfulfilled curiosity? Hmm. Okay. So I'm glad you asked that question um, because uh, curiosity are, does have both positive and negative aspects. And uh, if you actually go back in history, uh, for most of history, curiosity had a very negative connotation. You know, you might have heard expressions like curiosity killed the cat. And uh, 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 there is a very interesting article by Sundar Sarukai. Uh, it's titled Science and the Ethics of Curiosity. And he goes into the history of curiosity. So it's an extremely interesting article. So do look at it. It's, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, he makes the point that curiosity is actually a, a community, a collective uh, enterprise. And even though scientists might feel that, uh, you know, it is their individual curiosity sometimes which they are, which is driving them. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, whatever their discoveries, inventions, have uh, a larger effect on society. So a uh, completely unbridled curiosity can definitely have negative effects. And uh, this is something that we uh, should be conscious about. I, in children, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, curiosity could lead to risky behaviors. That is definitely possible. But the, um, you know, the positive aspect of it is that adults have a lot of, you know, adults who realize this have a lot of control. You, you know, you see curiosity going completely running wild with uh, social media and uh, the way that, uh, you know, things go viral. And uh, so, which has, sometimes it has very positive effects, largely negative effects, but you, yes, you see those. So has uh, maybe the questioning in the class has reduced because of uh, their access to more knowledge online? Mm -hmm. Would that be uh, also something that needs to be studied? I mean, the curiosity yeah. in the classroom yeah. versus asking questions right. on the Google. Absol absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I can tell you from, uh, 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 you know, my small personal experiences uh, uh, with kids, that uh, children who have uh, internet access are, uh, or even adults, uh, this, this happens at all ages, are reluctant to ask questions because you always feel that the, you know, it happens to me also, oh, the answer must be somewhere on the net. Let me check it out and let, let me not make a fool of myself. So yes, this, this, is, uh, this is certainly happening. Uh, so Savali Ram is, uh, you know, it is really aimed at uh, kids who do not have access, uh, primarily, primarily, although any uh, ch uh, children from any background can certainly submit questions, but it is aimed at children who do not have, uh, 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 who do not have access. And uh, uh, therefore, it is the teachers who have to collect the questions, submit them. I mean, it's a little bit of, uh, 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 you know, a job for the teachers to do. Uh, but uh, ultimately, if that is what is getting the children, so these are also children whom you don't hear from because yeah. they don't have access to the net. Uh, they don't get information and you don't, uh, you know, hear their opinions, their questions, their ideas uh, are not heard. And I hope Savali Ram will be a platform where uh, uh, these ideas can be heard. Uh, I have one last question. Uh, this is from Ms. Durga Bhavani. She says, why do we feel that the children get bored easily nowadays? Hmm, 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 hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, hmm. if this is happening, uh, you know, I'm not sure 
if this is happening nowadays or if uh, children were earlier were also bored um, uh, and it may have something to do with uh, thinking that uh, well uh, you know there is nothing special happening in the classroom uh, anyway uh, it uh, I, I really don't know. One would have to see what, what are the facts. So this is one, you know, availability of uh, internet is definitely, uh, you know, one thing that which has made uh, kids less interested in the classroom. And, uh, uh, you know, as teachers, I think we have to find ways to uh, kind of make the right use of the internet. And I'm sure that, you know, as teachers, if we discuss, we can come up with very good ideas of how to combine information from the internet or internet exploration by the kids uh, with something interesting happening in the classroom. Other reasons, uh, apart from that, uh, I don't actually see what has changed uh, that would uh, make the children get less bored. I guess, I, in my view, it, it is, uh, if you have any other ideas, please tell me. Uh, but I have not seen any research on this. Uh, so if, there is one research uh, that looked at uh, the, the effect of fast moving images. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, right. That, yeah, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, so Absolutely. when something moves very, the, 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 what we call it as addiction to fast moving images, Absolutely. because yeah. it gives you a sense of uh, some kind of uh, uh, doing something even though they are not actually interacting with mm -hmm. it. So when they come to a classroom, the teacher is stationary. Okay. It, it is not just in schools, even in, in uh, higher education. So there is this that actually also is making them a little bored. The fact that something has yeah. to go slow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you uh, made this point, Kavita. I think it's very important. And uh, you do see it happening. I mean, the preference for videos to uh, toys, for example, at home. So if there is a device available to a child where they can watch uh, you know, a fast moving cartoon film, uh, the child will take that. You know, and the youngest kids who can barely even hold that little tablet in their hand, they're holding it and they are just totally engrossed. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, these, these are the negative effects of technology. And it, it is ultimately negative, yeah, because it stops the children from learning. They, it takes away, uh, uh, you know, their most important tool of learning. Um, Thanks, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Jayashree. Uh, really, so very much. nice of you to actually, you did very well on a first time teaching over Zoom. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, you so know, that, I'll tell you my secret. Uh -huh. I, I gave a practice talk yesterday, uh -huh. which fell totally flat. I could not, just could not even bear to uh, listen to it again. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so I realized that I had to, you know, just change. It's, it's very hard when you don't have feedback. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one does one best. You know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, from behalf of all the audience, I don't think we can do any clapping, but uh, I thank you a lot for it. Thank you so much. So thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, uh, Professor Pijan has come back. Professor Pijan, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. So uh, lots of, you know, I learned it. I didn't know about Savari at all, of course, now <laughs> we will see it's a great resource. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next we have uh, Professor Anil Gupta. Um, uh, Vivek will introduce him. Sir, are you there? I see Gyan there. Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Oh, okay. Uh, I can change. Uh, let me see. I can change. This not a problem. What do I change? No, the, uh, I saw the gyan there. And I yeah, said, so let me see. That's a good enough word, sir. Ah, so that let gyan be there. Yeah, it's let the gyan be there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Let gyan be there. Let gyan be there. Yeah, yeah, please turn on your video so that we can see you. That's... Sure, 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 sure. I will do that. I think you can now see me. Yes. Yes. 
So, uh, so we'll give a Vivek will give a very Twitter kind of a 165 character ah, introduction. Ah, but बिल्कुल छोटा रखना, बिल्कुल छोटा. Ah, all speakers' <laughs> profiles are online. Okay, so everybody can go and look at uh, the profiles. So, Vivek, to you. Okay, ma'am. Um, a Padma Shri Professor Anil Kumar Gupta recently retired from I M Ahmedabad and is an eminent scholar in the areas of grassroots innovation. He is the founder head of National Innovation Foundation. which inspires innovation from children and adults alike he has been awarded with numerous honors and positions and is also the founder of the honey bee network a fellow of the world academy of arts and science professor gupta is currently a visiting faculty at i am ahmedabad and it bombay we are honored to have you with us today sir over to you thank you thank you thank you very much i was listening to some of the questions toward the end of uh, Jashi's talk, and I was very happy to see those questions because they provide a very good connectivity between what was being discussed and what I'm going to say. First of all, I am all for unbridled curiosity. I don't care about the negative effects because it is the responsibility of the teacher to handle uh, insatiable desire to ask questions. So, if I have to err on one side, I will err on the side of more curiosity rather than less. and what kavita mentioned in reaction to her her, her reaction to jashi's uh, point that, uh, that today children often don't ask as many questions in the class as one would expect or one would desire and this is the consequence of a very serious problem in our culture the problem is that when adults can have conversation and children will butt in and ask something that they don't understand the first remark that many of us would make or many of us have heard when we were children that uh, is none of your business you are too young to understand when you grow up you will understand and uh, unfortunately we don't grow up and then those questions remain subdued and then slowly and slowly we learn that children are supposed to listen but not speak their mind and this is very unfortunate similarly we laugh at somebody's uh, absurd or weird question and therefore we further censor the desire to ask silly questions what is silly question silly question is the one that may make your life difficult or easy depending upon how you take it so let me ask a simple question uh, all the friends on the in the session today have seen traffic lights and traffic lights are orange red orange and green now why would there be fourth light let's say there's a i i a child says a child ask a question what if there was a fourth light a blue light what would you think would be the purpose of blue light nobody has ever done that nobody has ever seen that traffic light why should somebody think of a fourth light anybody want to react please welcome then we can make it a conversation what do you think fourth light will do and why didn't we never think of it emergencies uh, yeah emergencies no 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 pedestrians not pedestrians light is not in the front of the traffic you know i am saying traffic light pedestrians traffic light will be on the right on the 90 degree to the traffic so what will be the purpose of blue light ambulances and all have blue light so if you can huh? i mean ambulances and no, police no, use not, not traffic light traffic light i know so if you put a blue light there if it if it is actually flickering that means either there is an ambulance coming or there ambulance a has a horn you know they have a special horn so when they come they come with a horn and everybody is supposed to give way to them isn't it all ambulances all over the world they have a protocol that when ambulance uh, ring the horn either ambulance or uh, police any emergency service van will have a horn and they play it loud enough to people to see it even before a kilo beyond a kilometer so that everybody clears the way and generally people do and now my my anybody yes uh, <laughs> no no that's interesting sonia but this is not the reason now my question is It, has it occurred to us has anybody thought about it i'm i'm trying to celebrate silliness because i think 
we are too rational, we are too organized, we are too uh, to continue going. No, no, Bapi, no, 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 no. In fact, the opposite of it. Adarsh Barnwal, a student at that time of 10th class in, 19, in 2013, thought of a problem that all of us have witnessed and that definitely in Hyderabad you have witnessed it. So has it been noticed in Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Delhi. All major cities have had this problem, which is of traffic jam. So let's say there's a traffic jam ahead and you are coming and you have a crossroad. And at that crossroad, before you get stuck in the jam, you are seeing a blue light. So you have an option of turning left, right or U-turn. But don't go ahead. If you go ahead, you are stuck in the jam, maybe for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. In Bangalore, in electronic city, sometimes it takes one hour for a kilometer, just one kilometer. It's so slow. So the point is, if you have a choice of taking a longer route, 10 kilometers longer, take it. That might take you faster to the goal than saving the kilometers and losing your hours. Now, Adarsh Banwal in Katihar, Bihar, which is not the metropolitan city, incidentally, is a small city, but nevertheless, there have traffic jams, notices this problem, sends an idea. Now, what has he done? He has done three things that we often feel shy of doing. First, he hasn't looked for, looked for a confirmation, as uh, you were saying, both of you were saying earlier, Jachi Damdas and you, that you know people look up the internet. If he had searched the internet, he wouldn't have found anything. So then the logic says if nobody has thought about how can an Indian young boy sitting in a small Bihar town think of something different? First reaction will be, Agar kisi ne nahi kiya, to nahi ho sakta na? In fact, many of our research students, not just school children, our research scholars feel inhibited when they don't find a reference. Damn it, when there is no reference on the problem, that is the discovery, that is a new point. You should be proud of that. But what is our general notion? I'm not saying in triple ITH, but in general, I'm saying scholarship. Sometimes faculty frown. Are you couldn't find one reference on this? Sir, I couldn't find because there is nobody who has worked on this problem. How can it be? How can it be that an Indian student can come out with a problem which nobody has worked upon? Such is our self-understanding, self-image of originality and innovation and creativity. That's unfortunate. So the so first thing the others did, he did not check. He did not seek approval from his peers, from his seniors, from Google. Second thing he did, he looked at a problem around him. Any one of us can see that. And converted that problem into a possible lead for thought of or of, for an imaginative solution. And third, he had gathered the courage to share it with us at that time. In 2014, he got an award at the end of Dr. Kalam. Now, all the three things anybody can do. And much depends upon the teachers because teachers often, pardon me for saying this, but I'm going to say this. Teachers have little tolerance for absurdity. You know what I do in my class, in a course, Creativity, Innovation, Knowledge Network and Entrepreneurships in a class. One of the prescribed reading is Abol Tabol. Anybody knows about Abol Tabol in the group? Any Bengali by chance? Anybody has heard this book? Kavita, make it a compulsory book. Compulsory reading for anyone with whom you want to discuss the subject of creativity and children, ever. Uh, okay. Please, yes, please go ahead. I said, I said, okay to your suggestion to make it a book of reading. You know why? Because it is a book of absurd poetry written by the father of Sri Satyajit Ray, Sukumar Ray, 100 years ago. In Bengal, almost any child would know some verses of Abol Tabol, Ulta Bulta. He, in, this, in, this, in these poems, like Alice in Wonderland, anything can happen. A moustache of a king got stolen. And there's a whole poem on that. So absurdity to me is the first requirement for a teacher to encourage, nurture and tolerate. And sometimes, in fact, many times, children can be very crazy. 
they can see things that we have missed. And I will give you an example of those kind today because I want to demystify our export power. Because I have walked so much all over the country, because I've seen so many innovations, still, let me give you an extra example of that kind. And then I'll show you some of the slides. We have, we, during our show, the Atras, which we do in summer and go to hot places, winter we go to cold places. So during show the Atras, we stay in generally school building or church or temple or somewhere, but generally schools. I've had children. Many of you have had, many of you have children. And they were young. Kids, some of them still maybe. And we all know that in a school, generally in the public school, or at least government schools, but is what I mean by public school, government schools, there's a common place where taps are faced for drinking water. And they are usually the one that I have seen almost everywhere in the country, in all the states. Sorry, there is a little disturbance, but I can't help it. It's on the street outside. I hope you can still listen to me. The taps are at a uniform height. Some children are small, some are taller. Girls are generally dwarf for them, the boys, etc., etc. And we all know that some children will not be able to drink water because they're too young, too tiny. But all schools have taps generally at the same height, which is about the height of about two feet or one and a half feet or two feet, two and a half feet, something of that kind, where the taller kids can have to bend down a little bit. These class six, seven kids can really reach that point. And the younger kids have to put some bricks or some support. So what did Chaya Thakur coming from a very poor family in Boru village in Asana? What we did was we asked the collector and Mr. Saroop was the collector of Gandhinagar. We asked him to send a circular to all the schools of government school to send an idea of a problem that they find around them and to solve it. And they can make a sketch, they can write two lines, whatever. And now we got about 5,000 ideas. Uh, currently, this competition is called Ignited Mind at anib.org, anib.org. Any child can send any number of ideas, no approval required, no certification required, no endorsement required from teachers, principal, or parents, or anyone. So, as I said, you have all the tabs at common height. Let's say you see my hand. Just tilt it. So, younger kids, smaller kids will drink water from the lower end, bigger ones from the higher end. So, let's say, uh, let me see if I have a pen here. And this is the way it is. So now the height has come down here. So younger kids think from what else? Taller from here, taller from here, taller from here. A problem that for last 70 years was not solved in any school of any, any state of our country was so effortlessly, so to say, effortlessly in quotes, solved by Chaya Thakur. So, you know, I invited her as a guest faculty to my class in IMA. And we sat in the faculty lounge on two chairs. On one chair, Chaya was sitting, on the chair I was sitting. And I asked Chaya, look, my, I want to tell my students that if they expect, they put too many conditions before solving a problem, they might not, but how did you solve the problem? She said, how did I solve? It is so obvious in, his, in her simple language, she said, to her it was a common sense. To none of us, to me, with all my knowledge of innovations, all my knowledge of creativity, all my knowledge of constraints, all my knowledge of empathy and samvedana, I did not think about it. I might have read the more ideas than anybody else in the world, probably, because we get we used to get at that time tens of thousands of ideas, and I was trying to go through as many of them as possible every year, for years after years, for 20 years, 30 days. So I had reasonably large repertoire of ideas that I had gone through, but I had never come across this idea. So we picked it up. She got an award. She also went to Rashpati Bhavan. The point I am to drive, drive home is the children have an uncanny ability sometimes to see through the things effortlessly. To them, it is not a big thing to see the contradiction 
in a problem. For us, it becomes too much of an effort sometimes to find why a problem has remained unsolved for such a long time. So my suggestion, therefore, is that we should perhaps be willing to accept that given the freedom, given the choice, without much tutoring and without much mentoring, if children could be given just the freedom to think about the problems that they see around themselves and which they wish to solve, they might just find a solution. So I have been teaching a course online in Hindi and English. Let us go, let us invent or innovate. And the first session in this course is, what is beautiful? So I'll show you a small, small slide. Of course, I don't show this, but I will, nevertheless, I'll show it to you. And I hope you can see this now. Can you see this? Yeah. So this is, so this is the slide that I want to show you. So what is happening here? My colleague Anamika took this photograph in a lake where she went uh, to see and see the birds. And she found, very interestingly, that this duck, this swan was following a path which all of these were not. And to me, it seemed beautiful and beautiful analogy that such that exist in every class, in every school, in every city, in every almost every family, extended family, who are not seeking approval, who are not looking for the trend, who don't care about finding an evidence of prior evidence of something somebody having tried, who just don't care in being different, in being a little more curious in being a little more creative. And I think these are the kids. Actually, every kid at one or the other point has this ability. Let me put it very clearly. Every kid at one or the other time has this ability. But some kids have this ability a little more than others. They may be poor in studies. They may be poor in academics. But their ability to see this and be able to... Just give me one minute. So even Zoom classes are like normal classes. Suddenly the teacher is called out for a meeting. So, so it, it actually is reality now. So uh, just to fill in before he comes, all of you please look at National Innovation Foundation site uh, where uh, there are a lot of very uh, interesting innovations by children too. National Innovation Foundation. you can Foundation. find them under, I'll give you this the website link maybe nifindia.org slash ignite, I think that is the link, but let me just check. Uh, uh, Kavita, you can mention that. Uh, later. Yeah, I, I will have, check. I'll check. But, I'll check but, you know what? but you know what? They have stopped Ignite competition. Now they only work on Inspire where the ideas have to be recommended by the principal of the school. Why? And I'm, I'm so happy that they stopped it because it would have killed the whole spirit of non-hierarchical, irreverent thinking. So we said, we will take, now we have taken over from last year. And Honeybee Network organizes the Ignited Mind at honeybee.org competition, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Ignited Mind Award. So we have uh, decided that we will continue with that, but NIF has stopped. Because the, the wise people in the DST realize that good ideas, they must be selected and recommended by the principal and teacher. Oh my God. Don't mind these teachers on this panel, but I would rather trust the students' ability to directly send their ideas, not because teachers don't, will not recommend them, but teachers will probably be far more organized in their thoughts and therefore might uh, eliminate the absurd ideas because they would think, oh my God, what will anybody think of our school if such an idea went up? 
and not realizing that we are looking for only those ideas which are which are seemingly absurd because these are the ideas that will change the world i mean if ever the world changes so my request to teachers is that please try to allow absurdity to prevail absurdity to remain you know in, in our childhood we used to have a game of puzzles game of riddles and those riddles used to uh, kindle our curiosity and also help us to think in opposites what is called as paradoxical thinking today the whole world is moving towards paradoxical thinking and we seem to be thinking in unitary unified thinking consensual thinking and there is no way we can stimulate our imagination our creativity or our uh, ability to solve problems by having too much of consensus and too much of conformity and too much of compliance and too much of convergence so my appeal to all my colleagues here is that we should try and see whether we could encourage the divergence which is sometime contradictory so it 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 just contradicts the idea it just opposes the idea and perhaps helps us to see how this can be taken forward now there are sometimes very silly ideas and these silly ideas i'll give you an example we organize a competition called as hvn kriya let me share this screen again and uh, now i think you can see this screen so this is of course the ignited mind at honeybee.org the last date is august 31 and the next one is hbn kriya the last date is same 31 and the email link is hbn kriya at gyan.org and this is for adults now let me say something very important here for my teacher friends many times and please don't mind my saying this many times teachers send their ideas in the name of children out of love out of affection out of a desire to help their children get awards recognition out of their desire to make their school well known teachers do that in science exhibitions all over the country you can see the consequence of this malice how deep it is how pervasive it is don't mind my saying it i'm a, i'm seeking your apo uh, i'm apologizing in advance for this because many of you feel hurt by this but the fact is that 90% of the projects if not 99% showcased in the science exhibitions are made by teachers or mentored by teachers or designed by teachers and what do we say our children what do we have tell our children go go and say my project is about this it is not his or her project she is being told to tell lie at young age children are institutionalized they are told in an institutionalized manner to learn to tell lie the ethical foundation of our imaginative consciousness has been completely nullified child has not designed it child is parroting a script that has been given by the teacher or parents and we celebrate that what could be more tragic so please all the teachers never never ever do that again doesn't matter whether children get award or not whether they get recognition or not whether their example their model is beautiful or not doesn't matter at all what matters however is that whatever children will do at least some of them will think of things that you may not have thought about that i may not have thought about and that will be our real reward if our children can think what we cannot think we have done a job that's what teachers are supposed to do so in some sense it is what we need to learn is to restrain ourselves in answering questions which to us are very obvious and which are intriguing to children and push them to think of possible ways in which that question could be answered by themselves that is what aristotle did that's what the traditional way of teaching was where we were used to help children to get answers themselves even if it took a lot of time if you couldn't complete the syllabus so it be doesn't matter but then you are saying no sir then we will not get our children will not get full marks and will not get uh, merit list and then will lose out in the life now that is a difficult question for me to answer 
I have no answer for that. I have no answer for that because if we want to make our children get merit, which I think every parent would like to have, then we should probably accept that academic merit and imaginative merit need not be same. And our country values academic merit more than the imaginative merit. So if we continue to remain dependent on the solutions from around the world rather than developing ourselves, so it be. Let's not have a desire that our children should create solutions which the whole world will appreciate. So when, when HBN Korea, we did an uh, international competition. And 2,500 ideas from 87 countries were reviewed. In nine countries, the award, the ideas got awarded. And one award from Iraq was very interesting. It was not by a child, by an adult, by a teacher. But I'm mentioning this because if we don't give award to adult, then adult will send their ideas in the name of children. So we had decided to separate two competitions. Has been clear for all adults, including teachers and parents, and ignited mind for children. So the idea was, that a soap was printed, 3D printed, with a small toy inside it. Now children would like to rush and push their parents and the family to wash hands as often as they can so that they can get the toy. What a behavioral impact of a small gimmick of putting a small tiny trinket inside the soap so that children have incentive to wash their hands and so have others. And children are now monitoring and tracking the washing of hands by the adults because they want to get the toy very early as possible, as, as early as possible. Small little game which conveys the concern of washing, but without telling them to do that by just gaming it by putting a small toy. Now, this is an example which I'm just picking up to say that it is possible that we can have ideas that are stimulating and imaginative and joyful, and why not? So let me go through a few more and then I will come. This is a very my favorite example because this she was in class eight at that time when she gave this idea we have all seen walkers and walkers don't have adjustable leg neither in europe nor in usa nor in australia nor in japan japan has a lot of elderly people they need walkers but none of the walker has adjustable leg so if you have to climb even one step you can't use the conventional walker this girl saw her grandfather facing a difficulty she just wrote two lines she didn't make anything she did not make anything. She just wrote two lines. What if the front legs were adjustable height? That's it. She just posed the question, not even gave an answer. What if the front leg were adjustable? And that question, fortunately, uh, we could capture out of thousands of ideas and get it fabricated. The team of NIF and the uh, company which licensed this technology has made it now. It's being sold. And it has changed the way walkers will be conceived in the whole world. It's a global solution. It's a universal solution. Designed by a little girl in Bihar. What now? Again, another example from Bihar. Why not? So children can think of solutions which solve not just Indian problem, but the whole world's problem. What is the difference? Why are, what are these children doing different than we, that we don't see, we don't want, we don't, we have not done? What they're doing different is that they are observing carefully. They are tracking the unmet need and they are moved by it. They have some Vedana. Some Vedana is They have some Vedana. They feel the pain of others, be it their grandfather, be it mother, be it someone else, be it a small kid. They can, they can see the pain of others. And I can tell you, children can feel the pain even of a bird or a squirrel or anybody else, not just human beings. And they can, they can, they, for them, it is very logical that if somebody has pain, generally speaking, I'm not saying all children, but most children feel the pain very easily. For them, you don't have to train them to do it. You, we train them to become insular. We train them not to worry about the whole world, but focus on their own interest. We train them to be selfish. We train them to be self-narrow, uh, to be self-centered and to be concerned only about their own well-being. That's what we do. But that's not the way normally children grow up to be in the normal course of the things as they would grow 
they would they will play with an ant they will they will like to play with a bird or a sink or a squirrel or whatever they see continuity in life if we draw the boundaries so let me take one or two more examples and then stop and then i would like to have conversation because i think the time we have only about 20 minutes so i want to give example of ahmed raza so we have we have been doing the children creativity workshop where we ask children to go and do research so they went to a waste site and they found a lot of cups lying around ahmed raza is a lovely boy I mean, he is a crazy boy no matter what you do if you have him him in a class and you ask question his hand will be the first to go up his father is a flower seller outside of nizamuddin mosque and uh, very poor family so he saw the cups and then he made this drawing as you can see this was his original drawing and it looks beautiful and we asked him what is he trying to say he said look if you have a rod and you put the cups like this you can more, put more cups in a place rather than in a box he saw the box like this so we did an experiment we invited him to ahmedabad and we said look this is what we did and we found that you were right on this on this uh, spike on this uh, rod you can get up to 700 cups whereas you see in this box we had only 150 and we shared this and there was a girl from surendnagar small village in a surendnagar sitting and listening to ahmed raza and she raised her hand she said you know i have a one more idea you can do it even better i said what is it she said you put a thread around the rod and when you take the cups out they will become a garland it will be easier to transport wow incremental innovation incremental addition now the kids were doing collaborative learning we didn't have to teach them it happened it happened we didn't ask them we just there were presentation going on we were not asking them what are your modifications for this they she just raised her hand because in her mind she was thinking can i do it better can i do it better can something better be done in this that was the question must have been nagging in her mind and i can tell you there are kids who may not be good in original thinking but they are very good in incremental thinking they are very good in additive thinking they can add a point they can add a new feature they can add a new function they can add a new form to the idea that's what she did and we must recognize that our brain is wired to think in different juxtapositions not all of us can think outstandingly well in each function of thinking or each function of logic or each function of imagine depending upon how we have been exposed to different environment and this girl i'm forgetting her name said if you have a thread along it all the cups move over the thread when they are pushed down then you take the thread out from two ends and you can transport you don't have to carry the rod around what a beautiful way of thinking what a beautiful way of saying it's suggesting so compressed cups will be easy to transport i'm just saying this problem all of us have seen show me one place one party one gathering of the students or faculty in any academic institution where they have followed this norm now that's not her raza's that's not raza's problem that's not that girl's problem that we don't we don't have better ways of dealing with waste but it doesn't bother us no but the child gets affected by it child get affected and thank god that they get affected and children have this sense my feeling is that they have this sense the way nature has designed the evolution of the children anyway the world i assume it's just that we are stifling this ability to think originally or adding feature to somebody else's thought let me take the last example and that's and then i'll stop so we, one of the tasks we gave to children the researcher the class i mean young kids doing research they have a cap on their head they have a notebook in their hand they have pen in their hand so one group went to a potter and asked questions okay how do you where do you get a clay from how do you make these pots this is the okay so how do you do this uh, on the revolving uh, uh, platform where you put the clay and make it and so on so they asked all kinds of questions then the kids came back and said uh, 
they they knew I was called as professor. Said, professor, tell us one thing that you will change in a Potter's cycle of things which will improve their productivity enormously. They were doing the same thing to me that I would do to them, and I was on the receiving end. And I said, maybe we can attach a small motor to the to the table turntable so that it can no. I said, maybe we can make a dough making machine so that the clay mixing, clay and water mixing can become easier. No. And after a while, I gave up. I said, sorry, I can't think of any other way. They said, now shall we tell you? I said, tell me. You know what they said? And look at the physics underlying it. Beautiful physics. They said, sir, the sieving of clay takes most time. We should design a better sieve that can sieve the clay faster and uniformly. That's the major constraint. Oh my God, you are right. If all the particles are not the same size <coughs> while making the pot, then the pot will leak. That's a good physics. We all know that when you fill a glass with irregular sized pebbles, the water moves faster. When you have same size of small made size clay, the water will move slowly. Oh my God, this was a beautiful idea. How did he, child, observe it? I have been seeing so many potters in our show, the Atras. So many. It never occurred to me. Simple physics. I never noticed it. I don't know how many of you noticed that. But something is there in our education system where we, the adults, the teachers, feel hesitant in admitting our ignorance. We think that if we tell a child in a class that I don't know the answer, something will be terribly will, will be lost. No, on the contrary, something will be gained. Children will know that even these so-called adult teachers, professors don't have the answers, then what is the wrong? If I don't have the answer, they will feel emboldened to ask more questions. So with that, that is my submission. That if we confess Honestly, not just put up a show. Honestly, when we don't have a good answer to a question, we say, well, we don't have a good answer, even though the question may be of class five, six, or seven, but I didn't think about it. Uh, I had no answer at that time when I gave all the options of the Potter's cycle chain of the value, and I couldn't notice this point. I somehow did not notice this sieving of the clay. So I will stop here. There are many more examples I can give, but I don't think that's important at this moment. What is important is for us to recognize that this is a problem that we can solve. First of all, this is a problem that we can solve. And much has to be done by the teachers, not by the children. That's my second submission. It is not a problem of children, it's a problem of teachers. Because we have somehow got used to seeking approval, seeking appreciation, seeking conformity, and we always feel good when a child gives an answer that we expect. And we feel bewildered when a child gives an answer which is out of sync completely. And we don't even ask the question, how did you think about it? Why did you think about it? Maybe there's some logic in your mind which we need so to understand. And that way we lose a track of thought which that child might have gone through in his or her brain. and come out with a convoluted answer, which to us seemed too strange and too far-fetched. And therefore, we ask the child to, we snub the child to sit down. And don't be stupid. And oh my God, that stupidity. If only we had gone into depth of that stupidity, some a novel way of thinking would have uncovered. So I stop here. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to discuss. Thank what. you, sir. Thank you. As usual, uh, very good talk. So any questions, uh, please put it on the chat or uh, you can uh, even unmute and ask the question. If nobody asks questions, I'm going to call out the names. <laughs> Let me see. There are some comments on the chat I can see. So one is how do you we inspire innovation? I would say that we don't have to inspire innovation. We have to inspire children and teachers to feel the unmet needs. Innovation is a consequence. The trigger is an unmet need and sometimes an underutilized resource. 
So I will always talk about that there are four things that an innovation club should do. Search, spread, celebrate the innovation and sense the unmet need. The fourth one is very important. The moment you identify an unmet need, somebody or the other will start getting bugged by that. And the rest will follow. Whether we like the answer or not doesn't matter to me. What matters is the ability of the kid to say, okay, this problem needs to be solved. Let me try. And uh, learning also requires unlearning. You know, the fact that there are some good answers and there are some bad answers. There are some answers which we celebrate and there are answers which we snub. I think we need to reflect on that. I always, whenever I meet teachers, I ask a question and I'm going to ask that question now. Is there a question that you couldn't answer in the class? Will anybody like to mention, share a question that he or she faced in the class and couldn't answer? Example, example. You, you can ask, unmute and ask if it is better yeah, please, in your please. own voices. Yeah, Dr. Babita, please. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sir, so I am a teacher educator at yeah. Manavrajna University, Faridabad. Uh, so uh, we, we train teachers in pedagogy of science and other subjects. Uh, sir, I think that if we train teachers in pedagogy of science and other subjects, क्योंकि ये अलग अलग टाइप के स्कूलों से हमारे पास आते हैं टीचर्स जो स्टूडेंट टीचर्स हैं बीएड करने के लिए मैं सर कोशिश करूं भी अगर अपने पेडेगोजी ऑफ साइंस की क्लास में कि क्वेश्चंस पूछें या आदत ही नहीं है सर जब तक यूनिवर्सिटी में वो आते हैं तो वो बस सुन सुनते ही हैं और मुझे लगता है कि अगर ये लोग अब नहीं पूछेंगे तो शायद अपनी क्लास में वो एनवायरमेंट पूछने का शायद प्रमोट नहीं करेंगे उनमें And that will give them courage. अरे डॉक्टर बबीता को भी नहीं मालूम इसका जवाब तो हो सकता है यार हमें नहीं मालूम तो क्या बात है फिर तो वो तो उतनी पढ़ी लिखी है वो तो हमको पढ़ाती हैं उनको भी नहीं मालूम है तो चलो फिर तो चलो पूछ सकते हैं फिर तो इसी पॉइंट वॉलरेबल उनके साथ जाइए ना कभी बाहर निकल जाइए कहीं पर भी किसी गार्डन में किसी फार्म में किसी स्लम में और वॉक करिए थोड़ा सा मैं तो बहुत चलता हूँ ना अपने स्टूडेंट्स को लेके जाता हूँ शहर में जहाँ जो मेरी क्लासेस में जिनको मैं गांव में लिया सकता हूँ उनको शहर में लेते स्कूल सिटी वॉक के लिए लेके जाता हूँ और किसी मोची के पास बैठ जाता हूँ और मोची से उनके पास बोलता हूँ ऑडिट कर दो यार इसके सारे टूल्स का यू नो इट टेक्स दैम आवर्स टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट दैटल स्टैंड दैट यू हैव नो ट्राइप एंड जिस पे जूते रख के की लगाते हैं It takes them lot of effort. My students of आई एम ए स्टूडेंट टेक लॉट ऑफ टाइम टू अंडरस्टैंड कि ये जब बना था जब जूतों में कीले होती थी सही है जी सर अभी तो जूतों में खिले नहीं होती ना नहीं सर तो क्या चाहिए हमको सर ग्लू चाहिए <laughs> नहीं ग्लू क्या चपकाने के लिए क्या चाहिए सर ब्रश चाहिए गोल्ड चाहिए <laughs> नहीं वो तो है लेकिन कैसे उसको दब, उसको अपनी जगह पे कैसे दबाएंगे क्या करेंगे उसके लिए क्या चाहिए होगा फिर यही चाहिए होगा सर शायद हैमर राइट द हिट इट विद द हैमर No, no, but they hit. But they, you don't need a hammer because you know when you put a liquid and you put a hammer, the air will rush in. But not is so that will create a, the joint will become weaker. So what do you need, Babita? So just just a little pressure wherever. Ah, so you need a clamp. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, na? Yes. To keep the sole pressed. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. China ne banana, Mongolia ne banana, ham ne ne banana. I have studied this problem all around the world. What I am trying to say, साथ में जाओ ना। हाँ जी। और students के साथ चलो ना थोड़ा सा, देखो ना आसपास, and expose yourself to a vulnerable situation where you don't even have the answer. 
when you don't have the answer they will feel emboldened jitni sawal hamare students class ke bahar puchte hain na utne class mein nahi puchte ye dikkat har sab jagah hai sir ek bachcha aapko corridor mein follow karega class ke bahar aayega ki shayad shayad ma'am ye ye ho sakta tha uh, sir jaise bahut choti choti koshishein ki uh, uh, ki pittu uh, khela jata tha है ना तो पिट्ठू से क्या थीटा सिखा रहे हैं हम सिमिट्री सिखा रहे हैं गेंद कहाँ मारी जाए कि बहुत दूर जाए आ, क्यों, क्यों, क्या कॉन्सेप्ट है जो हम पिट्टू खेलने से सिखा सकते हैं तो एक बच्चा आपके बाहर आएगा सर कॉरिडोर में आपके पास आके आपको रोकेगा क्लास में नहीं बोलेगा सर वजह है कि जो पीर, and conformity is something that family reinforces that teachers reinforce that peers reinforce and when somebody tries to break that trend you laugh at that person so the it's a cultural issue but we can change it we can change it by by making the conversation focused on those who are trying to do something different something absurd something illogical or something seemingly irrational something doesn't fit into the thing and uh, there is a teacher for example rakesh in panch mahal masti ki paathshala hai uski masti ki paathshala kya karta hai kuch bachche hain jo khidki se bahar dekhte rehte hain to wo bolta hai ki tumko bahar jana hai bolo ha to jao na to wo bachcha bahar chala jata hai ghum phir ke thodi der mein aa jata hai 15 20 minute ke baad mein fir wo sun leta hai teacher ki baat ko thodi der ke liye pad leta hai but then that child has a desire he is lot of energy bachcho mein bahut energy hoti hai na unko aap bithaye rakhoge to kaise kaam chalega so i think we should give both young teachers as a young teacher training as well as students an option to uh, interact in uh, unfamiliar circumstances in taking up problems that are difficult or not usual Uh, interact with people who solve problems and understand how did they think about it when they couldn't occur it didn't occur to them so this time i'll give you one small example i have i have sent i think to kavita i will send her again there are four questions which i ask all the students and teachers with whom wherever i give lecture to answer and i'll send it to you and she will share it with you one of the first question is during lockdown you're all working at home most of you so you have service providers you have servant you have uh, domestic aid you have sweeper you have gardener you have driver you have a security person you have a vendor milk vendor and all of these people you are witnessing them every day early you didn't have time to solve notice them they come every day work at home or visit you and go away sometimes they have been doing that for 3 4 years and we don't even know anything about them as to where do they come from and uh, how do they survive in such little income that they get and so on so i said talk to them and say that they are at that they have an assignment where they have to show something that they have learned from these people something interesting something different whether technological institutional cultural whatever and i tell you i got such wonderful insights from this similarly they were supposed to identify the unmet need of the elderly so one person said one kid said sir when my grandfather gets up from the cot the cot is slightly lower height and his uh, so now of course she explained that logically that uh, her knees his knees are not at 90 degrees so they they are acute angle so it takes lot of effort for him to get up from the bed now answer is raise the height of the bed but nine out of 10 people sitting in this meeting sitting right here in this conference in this class in this interaction may have faced the same problem with the elderly in their families where they may have difficulty because our beds are not too high and depending upon the height of the person the if the knees are not at 90 degree then they will have difficulty in getting up it's a simple physics ergonomics child notices it because that assignment asks that child to notice it give that assignments and they will start noticing it so i don't think it is very difficult to unlock the creative energy of the children but for that we have to unlock our own energy also yes yeah, so it's a very so, nice comment by uh, dr sarala uh, science is called natural science in our school days it should be in the true sense true i agree with that that's a very important point because 
the nature has uh, such diversity, Kavita. You know that there are no two plants, no two birds, no two trees, even not two, not two snowflakes are seen. Every snowflake is a crystal, if you see under the microscope. And no two snowflakes have the same structure. Nature never repeats itself exactly. Though it has redundancy in genetic sequence, there it repeats. But then again, the protein that code the DNA are so very, so the function of that redundancy changes. Otherwise, nature does not repeat itself. Replicate itself, I would say, repeat itself, but does not replicate itself exactly as it is. So such an original thought, so springboard of our learning. No two trees are alike, no two birds are alike, no two human beings are alike, no two rocks are alike. And yet, we want to be same as everybody else. And we don't want to learn this from nature. So I think it's a very good remark. I appreciate this. Just nature itself is a, such a good source of very beauty. But we want uniformity. We want consistency. So I think we should ask children to look at the tales of the two two tales of the distribution. I mean, if every teacher starts telling kids to look at the tales and not the plus minus two standard deviation in any phenomena that they have to study, I think their mind will open up. To me, that seems a simple pedagogic view. Ask them to look at the two tales and juxtapose them, contradict them, find out why they differ so much in a distribution, in any population, any phenomena for that matter. And I think they will start getting to the crux of the matter. So, so paradox is the way of way forward. That's how I began. We need to look at, we need to bring the sensitivity to con of contradictions in the class and not conformity. I don't know if it helps, but that's the way I look at it. And this, this comment is very true. The teachers are killing the creativity. You are right. Very right. Very right. So, uh, so what can we do? I mean, so the question I think we get asked even last time when we did this workshop uh, was what can a teacher do uh, given that we all have to follow syllabuses and all that stuff that can change or bring in a different kind of a, a thought process in the, this one. It can be part of the syllabus or it can be outside the syllabus. I uh, think one, yeah, Kavita, one thing I would suggest is that we should Whenever we ask a question, we should not pose it as if there's only one answer. So when questions are framed in a manner that there could be multiple answers and each could possibly be right depending upon the context or the constraint, that will help children get into more diverse thinking. Our preference for certain answers is the problem. Our preference for certain ways of solving problem is the problem. We also look, should encourage metaphorical learning, heuristic learning, underlying the, uh, I mean, we don't use the word concept very often in our conversation. Yes. Sorry. Somebody is, no, no, it's somebody is. Okay. Can, can somebody, uh, Mr. Suri Narana, your mic is on. Can you please turn it off? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I just want to ask uh, Gutta ji. Yeah, please go ahead. Don't ask, tell me. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You're, uh, you're un you have to unmute. Surinayanji, please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm Mr. Surinayan, uh, teaching math in the Krishnamurti Foundation in Benares. Ji. Uh, and uh, I follow your, I mean, some of the ideas. And then uh, we are having a NGO in Uttarakhand, uh, helping a school there. Uh -huh. uh, basically for, uh, you, you know, that the region is a mountain region. Yes. Uh, uh, we have a, a, like a happy by nature school. The name itself is happy by nature school. So uh, it's like, you know, some of the districts and then uh, in some states, they are introducing the happy class, you know, uh, in every school. Mm -hmm. So is, it any, is there any way that uh, you can uh, uh, recommend or uh, because you're a well-known person to the uh, CBSC board or other boards, at least uh, have uh, one or two classes in a week where uh, the kids will do on their own, you know, sort of thing. I mean, uh, encourage the creativity part when you are talking about the creativity part. Uh, this I have seen in one of the schools in USA. I was there for 10 years. So they encourage the creativity part, you know, just leaving like that. So is but there any possibility? But, that but tell me one thing. 
assume for a minute cbse does not change itself assume for a minute should i let my children suffer because cbse doesn't change i would not so when i introduce the course show the applied ima after having been doing and continuingly doing show the applied outside the institute the courses committee began to discuss the course so they said where is the session by session outline there was no session by session outline where is the reading list i said reading the band in this class in this course nobody will be allowed to bring any book or uh, literature with them in the class so how will they learn and then then we we discussed briefly for some time and then they began debating among themselves after an half an hour or 40 minutes one professor said look the students want to learn and he wants to teach let us try at least one year and then we will see if it doesn't work we will uh, ask him to come back again they never had to come back again now what i'm saying is there was no precedence why do you care about precedence why do you care whether the syllabus permits or not the framing of questions i mean asking looking for math in the organization of the citrus fruit is a practical way in which we can ignite the curiosity of the child cut the lemon and see the way worlds are organized look at the angles find out the exceptions in the world why some fork or some uh, pieces are little bigger than others or are they all uniform why does nature make errors what could have been the reason let them cut five lemon and then see now these are practical ways we can do that and i would like to go into the geometry i would like to go into trigonometry i would like to then take up the progression of the way different seeds are formed and set in the lemon and i can i will go and work out the mathematics of that so why shouldn't why should i insist that i should be allowed to do that i am teaching numbers i am teaching logic i am teaching organization i am teaching design i am teaching the way uh, math is underlying the every part of nature there is nothing possible in nature without mathematics in fact anything you take and we can get numbers out of that so i don't see that uh, problem is cbse cbse will remain all bureaucracies are designed to conform and uniform the purpose of purpose of bureaucracy to standardize and it's for a long time to come we will not be able to get away from the bureaucracy but we can get away from bureaucratizing our way of teaching that is in our hand kavita this is what i'm saying the subject that we want to teach we can teach it through real life interactive processes of things around us and that will be interesting i mean i would like children to observe how women are organize utensils in the kitchen so for example you have vases which have handle and you have vases which don't have handle ask them to put one over another you give them one square meter of space in kitchen ask them to arrange the vessels they will not be able to arrange vessels if they have handles because one vessel will not go into another now they have a problem at hand you have to solve that problem so the question after some time they will say yes we need handles but can we fix we can we have a, a retrofitting handles can we have handles which can, we can adjust to any vessel that will be the answer that might be the answer which might come out or some other answer might come out but we are not challenging them we are not challenging yeah, i agree i agree totally so we can create we can create a puzzle you know paradox and puzzle are the two key words we need to problematize we need to puzzle, create puzzles in everyday life and then the things will happen and we need to be also careful about language because language shapes the habit of thought too much of uh, reification is a problem in our language reification is to give active sense to passive phenomena car doesn't start table doesn't move this is a reified statement i should say i cannot start the car i cannot move the table now that is another thing that we should pay attention to children should learn to take responsibility for what they can or cannot do rather than us saying system doesn't work cbs doesn't work are bhai cbsc system ko to hum log change nahi kar sakte aaj but hamare bachche ka bhavishya to hamare haath mein hai usko to change karna padega na lekin and we have to help children get lot of provocations lot of stimulations kavita knows more than i do on the how different kind of stimulants make different kinds of synaptic linkages in the brain and the more diverse the stimulants probably the more synaptic linkages get built so it is not the connections but it is the density and distribution of connections that really make our brain work the way it does 
So, sir, Marat, sir, one uh, there's one question from uh, Dr. Sarila wants to ask the question. She's the one who ahead. made the comment on natural sciences. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. I am Sarila, teaching undergraduates from St. Anne's College. Uh, we are autonomous, fortunately, or I do not know, unfortunately, fortunately, yes. Uh, we have the freedom, academic freedom to change the syllabus, but only to a certain extent. 20% deviation, 80%, like that they keep saying. Now, my question is, we've been focusing more on teaching, teaching pedagogies, teaching ways and refining, modifying and things like that. But at evaluation, we are again, uh, you know, cut down on certain issues. Maybe our evaluation pattern should be in such a way that kindles the creativity. Whatever we are teaching, they should be tested in that direction. You teach something, you test something, and results are something else. And we also want our students to be, you know, competing with all the others at national competitive exams and things like that. So how do you think that all these things can coexist? I would say that... Uh the number of creative ideas that we get from small cities, relatively speaking, generally is much more than from metropolitans. So perhaps too much of exposure to knowledge as was being mentioned by Jashree earlier, and I was also saying that too much of choice, too much of uh, uh, ready-made information stifles our thinking. But the question about competitions and scoring well is a problem that is very difficult for me to answer because I have suffered in my life. In my 11th class, which was a board exam, the teacher would cut my whole page of English language because I used to do a lot of mistakes. My English was very bad. So he was trying to tell me that I should learn and copy from the keys and then I, my scoring will improve. And I said, no, I will write myself. So I made it unconsciously or subconsciously and make a trade-off between writing myself, my thoughts, rather than writing well for good score. So I got about 40% marks in English, so 35, 36, or just pass marks, 40% marks in English. And in drawing also, I got very poor marks. So I got second division in my grade level. Practically, the career in science was almost blocked. But my marks in science, math were very good. So I managed. What I'm trying to say is, these are difficult choices. I mean, very difficult to say to any parent that you should not let your child score well. Uh, but I would say that as a human being, do we want our children to become just a learning machine or do they want, we want them to become a thinker, a problem solver or a creative uh, mind? so that they, th they solve complex problems. And I found a comment very nicely, a nice comment a while ago, and I should underline that. How do we encourage slow learning or slow thinking or slow reading? You know, I'm going through, a I'm evaluating a thesis, and it is about 300 page thesis from South Africa, and I'm reading it word by word, and it takes me time. Uh, I, I, and I don't want to rush it because I'm enjoying the reading it. Now, some slow reading, slow thinking is not compatible with a high paced uh, exam-based culture, and I think there is a paradox there. I would, I would not pass any judgment there. I would not say that we should impose our values on the children. Let their parents decide what they want their children to be, or what children decide. But if you come across a obstinate fellow, you come across a rebel, please nurture that rebel. Save that child from his or her parents. Save that child from his or her. Uh, friends and peers who are making fun of that child. I think we need to save those souls which are already uh, framed as a non-conformist thinker. There are such children in every class. My request is to save those kids somehow and help them grow in life and mentor them because, yes, we cannot produce such children, but they, then there are there in natural way, in the natural distribution of the population, there are such children. We should nurture them and help them to go forward and maybe help them make connections for them if need be. That helps actually. It helps a lot. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, there's one idea of, a, of a, a innovation that Professor Bapiraju has put, his mother-in-law's. 
Yes, I saw that. I must say now that you have used this word Jugaad, I must say that Jugaad mindset is the greatest enemy of innovation. Makeshift solutions, temporary solutions will never let our society go far. Whereas this example that you have given is not a Jugaad. It is a scientific example. If you, you can measure it and calibrate it and prove it that by putting ice cubes, after churning will help in solidifying the fat and it gets just uh, gets condensed into the mass and then you can take it out easily rather than uh, doing it otherwise. So therefore, it's a very scientific thing what your mother-in-law is doing and please don't call it Jugaad. Jugaad is temporary solution. It is a makeshift solution. It may not ever rep always reproduce. It is not durable. This one is a durable solution. It has lasted centuries. So I mean, millennia, I would say rather. Ever since ice was discovered, women have been using it. So. Thank you, sir. Thanks Thank a lot. Uh, I, from behalf of all the participants, uh, really a great talk as usual. So uh, we hope to see you sometime here. Uh, but just shift the show, Dhyatra, for uh, summer may we'll go to cooler places, winter may we'll go to hotter places. No, no, no. no. Then we'll all come. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> voluntary suffering is the heart of the matter. No, 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 no. no. Sir, what? So, okay, it's being recorded, so I should not say anything. But thanks a lot, sir. And uh, thank you for the great session. I will send you the assignment that you can share with the participants. If they wish to ask, answer it themselves or their student, please get it done. Yeah. And also put up the link for the uh, Honeybees uh, innovation thing. Yes, yes. The, the competition, the March. Competition, March. Yes. yes. Yeah. Both at Ignited Mind at honeybee.org for, uh, for uh, children. Yeah. And uh, for adults, that means teachers. Yes. Uh, the HB and Kriya. Yep. I so agree. that will be very helpful. That will be very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Enjoy Thank myself. You. Bye. Bye bye. I'll just put this and then go. Yep. So this is for adults. Ignite Mind is for uh, children. children. Ignite yeah. Mind is for children. And HB and Kriya is for adults. Yeah. Oh. All so right. we'll anyway be putting up a resources one. So I'll put up yeah, all yeah. these resources and share yeah. it with everybody. Thank all you, right, sir. sir. Thank bye. you. Bye -bye. bye bye. Thanks a lot, participants. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you, Jay Shri, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. Bye bye.